With the Paths to Abstraction, I was really wrapped when um, the gallery approached me to come and speak tonight because, you know, there's nothing that terrifies a non-artist more than being approached by a gallery and asked to speak on anything vaguely artistic. But the question that they were saying is with Paths to Abstraction, they were looking at what was going on in this not exactly a movement, but in the in the development of the abstractionist period, I guess, in art. And it coincided with, they asked me to speak about what was going on at science in science at the same time. You could not have picked a more perfect parallel in science uh, for that time. If, if you think of abstraction as the opposite of concrete, as we do in education and communication when we're thinking about ways of thinking, um, abstract thought was at its absolute um, ultimate in the, uh, in the same period in science as, uh, as parallel with the period that um, Paths to Abstraction crosses over. So, um, so very happy to be here. Um, I, uh, do we have any quantum physicists in the audience tonight? Damn you. Uh, <laughs> you can pick me up on anything. I might get a little bit wrong, but... Uh, <laughs> but um, what we're... Uh, what we're talking about here is what happened at the turn of last century in our knowledge of science. And if I can just set the scene for you, Paths to Abstraction goes from 1867 through to 1917. Between 1867 and 1900 in science, some incredible things uh, had been discovered, to add to what had been discovered before that. But there were more than a few scientists who were pretty cocky uh, at the turn of the 20th century, strutting about thinking they pretty well knew everything there was to know. Just a little bit of tinkering around the edges was required. And they had good reason to think that because most of the things that they experienced in their everyday world, that we still experience in our everyday world, could be explained or understood by what they knew then. Um, in, you know, just before the period began, Darwin had just published The Origin of Species, a book that hasn't been out of print since. Darwin, as you know, was able to, by using the classic scientific process of um, observing, taking copious notes, thinking about, and then spending 17 years faffing around and procrastinating before actually writing the article, um, was able to come up with his thesis on the theory of natural selection um, or evolution by natural selection where the, the basic idea that if you're better suited to an environment and there's a pressure selecting for that quality you have that makes you better suited, you'll be the one to survive. It's fundamental to not just an understanding of evolution, but to how we approach biology in general and how we see the way organisms in the world, plants, animals, bacteria, slime mould, interact and progress um, from the humblest bits of pond scum we started off as. So, Origin of species, done. Gray's anatomy, not the McDreamy version, the, the surgery, um, anatomy of the human body, the physiology, had been written and was becoming better and better understood. So we had a really good sense by the end of last century of how the body systems linked together. There was even linking of form and function, why the organs that we had were shaped the way they did to do the jobs they do and relating that back to evolution and natural selection. So biology was at a pretty nice position at that time. Chemistry, which I have to say, um, I know there's at least one chemist in the audience, chemistry had been a complete ass about hodgepodge for um, a couple of centuries before that time. It literally was the experiment where you suck it and see, you add something and see if it blows up, you make a few notes and see if you can read them through your stained you know, copy book. Uh, chemistry was, was something that was really driven by alchemists by this quest to try and turn everything they had into gold. Um, and there was a lot of failure along the way, but there was also a lot of mishmash and a lot of semi-understanding and a wonderful Russian upstart, Dmitry Mendeleev, who had to be a Virgo. The man took every bit of information that existed and pulled it all together, looking at patterns in the different elements that had been discovered and studied. So thanks to Mendeleev, we had what to most of us looks like a half-finished game of Tetris, but is actually the most compact and beautifully descriptive table of all of the known elements. He had all of the ones that were known at the time. We've added another 60 or so since. The periodic table of the elements. If you're a chemist, it really is basically all you need to know to get started in a lot of ways. It tells you so much. So chemists had a great go, but it wasn't just about, you know, organising and tables and things for them as well. Um, Le Chatelier came up with um, his principle of, uh, of equilibrium, which said if you've got a system 
that's in equilibrium. He was talking about chemical systems, but it was heavily adapted by economists later on. If you've got a system that's in equilibrium and something comes along to change that equilibrium, and when I say equilibrium, I mean, I mean in balance. So if there's um, something pushing this way and something pushing back that way, and they're in balance, same sort of push on both sides, that's equilibrium. And he came up with the principle that is, if something comes along to push it a bit further this way, well, the system will push back to fight and get status quo. It works in chemistry, in, um, in reversible reactions, that was Le Chatelier's principle, but it also works in economics up to a point, um, GFC notwithstanding. Uh, so those sorts of thoughts, those big ideas were already around by the end of last century. Geologists didn't have quite as much luck, <laughs> poor loves. Um, they had, you know, obviously got um, the, the sediments and fossils and things. They were a bit perplexed why so many fossils were found on mountain tops, and, and it was going to be another, you know, 60 or more years before they, they knew anything about continental drift. So there was a lot of denial in geology, but there was also a lot of um, old white man thinking coming down from Lord Kelvin, who was the head of the Royal Society at the time, and basically arguing down anyone who said that the earth was any older than 150 million years. So there was a bit of a stall there um, from, from that period in geology. But to their credit, they did have, um, you know, they, they hadn't actually had access to the area they needed to get to, to understand plate tectonics and the way the earth was forming, which was deep under the sea and short of a very long term, term bit of um, keel hauling. You didn't really have much opportunity in those days to, to see down there. So so there was good reason for science and scientists to be quite cocky that they really got the world at that time, to really think, yeah, yeah, Marie Curie had just discovered um, radiation and, uh, and, you know, it, it was all, everything was falling into place. There wasn't really that much left to go. And then came a man who wasn't content to think about the world that he saw the world that could be explained by Newton's incredible laws of motion, by the um, electromagnetic theory, by any of those phenomenal physical um, determinants that had, that had been elucidated in the last couple of centuries and refined to the point where everything could be explained. Albert Einstein wasn't happy just to think about the world that could be seen and could be measured and could be understood. He went to a, a way of thinking about things that completely still challenges most of us, the vast majority of us today. It's so counterintuitive what he came up with. If you're thinking about paths to abstraction, Albert Einstein is the man who took us from basic scientific process, observation and experiment, he took us on an abstract journey that gave us the most ridiculous capacity to understand not just the world around us, which we kind of already had at the basic level, but the world that could be around us if we travelled anywhere near light speed or, um, or if we were massive things with huge, as amount, uh, huge amounts of matter in it. So um, the, the theory or the, the equation that you all have heard of any number of times, E equals MC squared, was, um, wasn't actually published with his uh, first publication on relativity in 1905. It was a little addendum that he sent a few months later, thought it might be nice just to add the equation into the story that he'd put in there. Um, this equation on its own, if, if that had been all he had ever done, and it certainly wasn't, he put out five papers that year, um, which is the great, uh, you know, boost, boost you get to publishing if you're not working in the university system. Um, you're able to put out a lot more. Uh, he'd put out five papers that year. Three of those papers had profound effects on physics, but this one in particular, the one talking about special relativity, was to change the way that he, the, his colleagues and we think about energy and matter. That would have just made him famous, but it was the fact that he didn't let go of that, that there was a part B to his, um, to his relativity idea that incorporated gravity that came along a little later. But let's get back to, um, to E equals MC squared and what it actually means. You've heard it, you've seen it. The E is energy, the M is mass, the C is the speed of light. The speed of light was known already to be constant at 300 million metres per second, incredibly fast. That's about 10 billion kilometres per hour, very fast stuff. Putting it in an equation like that might not mean anything to most of us, and you might have heard it hundreds of times but not really got what it's about. But by Einstein saying energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, 
he was actually saying that energy and mass are the same thing. They are two versions of the same thing. If you look at me, I've got a certain mass. It gets, like most of us, greater as I age. Uh, but that mass is not just made up of the matter that I have, it's actually a measure of the total energy that I have. Energy and mass are two extremes of the same thing. Mass is a property of matter, the stuff that we're made of, the atoms, the molecules. So it's made of all those subatomic particles and things. But really what they are is an incredibly condensed version of energy. They're just energy condensed down into particles. And energy is just mass that's expanded. It's an absolute mind-blowing concept. It had never occurred to anyone before. It still rattles around in my head every now and then when I try to think about it, but every time something gains or loses energy, and this is where the interest for our contemporary obsession comes in, it gains or loses weight as well. So if you gain energy, you're actually getting greater mass. If you lose energy, you're actually losing mass. The two things, it's... It's just so crazy and so counterintuitive that two things we know. Here's a pen. It's got a certain amount of matter in it. It's got a certain amount of mass. But if I move that pen, I gave it some energy, it actually weighed more while I was moving it than it did while it was standing there. If I threw this pen down to my friends who turned up very late and had reserved seats at the front, and I should shame by making them arrive up here right now. And in fact, I believe I shall. Please join me welcoming the latecomers down to their reserved seats that no one else could occupy. The pen will get much heavier if I throw it. No, I probably... I'll just demonstrate. OK. Well, it won't get much heavier, but there was more mass in the pen as it was moving because I gave it energy. I added energy to the system. Energy is just mass that isn't condensed. But if you're talking in the way Einstein was about mass, about relativism, the total mass of the pen was greater while it was moving. They've calculated the energy of a baseball. If you throw a baseball at 160 kilometres an hour, which apparently people can do, that baseball actually gains, I've got the figure here, um, two billionths of a kilogram. Two billionths of a kilogram while it's moving through the... Oh, it's OK, I don't need the pen, but thank you. Um, fantastic service here at the gallery, yeah. <laughs> um, if you, every time you use your mobile phone, it's losing weight because it's using energy. If you've got a mobile phone, you've got it charged, that's 10 kilojoules of energy that the phone has got. You gave it 10 kilo, kilojoules of energy by charging it, by plugging it into the wall. It actually weighs more when you charge it up than when it's uncharged. If I take that fully charged phone and make enough phone calls on it, it is going to lose 10,000 billionths of a kilogram in weight. It's crazy, but it's real. And this is why Newton's world was enough to explain the world that surrounded us, because those numbers are so stupidly small, we could never hope to measure them in, in any realistic sense at this level. But it's not enough if you're going very fast or if you're a very big thing. Suddenly, these numbers become very important. But the thing to remember is that every time energy changes, so every time, I should say, every time something's energy changes, if it gains energy, it gains weight, it gets more mass. If it loses energy, it loses weight because it loses mass. The two, two completely different things that were thought of before Einstein put this proposition suddenly became united. A um, couple more examples. Boil your cup of water in the microwave. You've heated the water up, so you've given it energy the water now weighs more. Its mass increases by a million billionth of a kilogram, OK? Again, small amounts. If you want to talk big amounts, you have to go to a slightly bigger system, something like the sun. The heat and light that we get from the sun comes from the nuclear fusion reactions that happen when hydrogen atoms smash together. It takes four hydrogen atoms to make a helium atom. Hydrogen is just a proton, nothing else electron, but they get blown off at that temperature. So hydrogen atom is a proton. One hydrogen atom whacks into another, two more whack into there, and you end up not with four protons, but two protons, and two of the, those protons become neutrons. That's the nucleus of a helium atom. Hydrogen has become helium, and what happens in that process is a tiny bit of the mass from those hydrogen atoms gets converted 
not to a tiny bit of energy, because the amount of energy that we're talking about, even though it sounded minuscule in those earlier examples, the amount of energy we're talking about is the mass times the speed of light squared. Now, the speed of light, 300 million. The speed of light squared, 90,000 9, million, million metres per second squared. So you're multiplying that tiny bit of matter by 90,000 million, million. So you get this massive amount of energy. That's where the warmth and, uh, and light from the sun comes from, this incredible amount of energy from this tiny bit of matter, this tiny bit of mass. So when you're on a big scale like that, it really counts. The sun actually loses far more weight than the mobile phone, the, the, um, the bas baseball once it stops being thrown. The sun loses four million tonnes every second. That's how much energy it's churning out, enough to lose four million tonnes of mass every second. Energy and mass are the same thing. If you increase energy, you increase mass, you increase, you gain weight. So that in itself was phenomenal. It would have made Einstein pretty famous. It would have already given us this um, uh, famous within science circles, you know, as famous as Faraday or Rutherford or any of those other, you know, cover boys of the science world. Um, not really as famous as he became. That became because as if that wasn't mind-blowing enough and abstract enough, so that was happening in 1905, but something bothered him about it, and that was that he couldn't explain his system, his e equals mc squared worked if he ignored gravity. Not that he hadn't sort of tried to get gravity in there, he just, he confined E equals MC squared to a world without gravity. And that was what made it a special theory of relativity. It was a special case where you didn't take into account gravity. Over the next 10 or 12 years, he put so much thought into this and came up with, as if energy and mass are the same thing wasn't crazy enough, he came up with a way of dealing with the gravity problem, and that was just to say, because um, don't forget, it was Newton, you know, the apocryphal apple, etc., who said that, um, that gravity is a force, and the force of gravity depends on the mass of the, of the object. It's, it's the, the greater the mass, the greater the force of attraction. So Newton, gravity is a force. Einstein, trying to deal with how do we get this force in here. So he just said, actually, gravity, not a force something slightly weirder going on there. Gravity is what you get because of mass. If something has mass, and we now know that that means if it's got mass or energy, that thing is going to affect stuff around it in a way that we feel as gravity. And the stuff that he was talking about, so you've got mass and energy already being collided over there. Einstein said, you know, in our world, everything seems pretty straightforward. The clock ticks, the days go by. Time is one thing, space is another. That's how we feel it. Einstein said, no, nah, time is a part of space. Time is not some absolute. It's in no way absolute. Clocks measure intervals of time, but that's not time. Time is what you get when you've got space. It's the fourth dimension. You've got up, down, up, down, left, right, forwards, backwards, and then you whack time in there. It's no more special than any of those other things. If you understand that, you're well ahead of me. It's a very difficult thing. It's incredibly counterintuitive. And that's, again, why this guy coming into the world, thinking the way he did and questioning the way he did, took science on just this journey that wasn't possible. People have said that the um, e equals mc squared equation was something that was waiting to be discovered. It would have happened if it wasn't for Einstein. Something else, someone else would have come up with it in five years or so. This idea of space-time, which meant that he could get rid of gravity in his explanation of general relativity, a guy, a famous writer in the 70s, who I can't think of right now, said that um, if, you know, if Einstein hadn't come up with that, we probably still wouldn't have it now. It was that outrageous and that special that space and time are the same thing. Not only that, you can mess with them. They're not absolute. Space and time can be warped. And I mean, to us now, we hear all this stuff. We know about, you know, or you, you at least hear the terms in, in science fiction or in, in whatever, in physics lessons. But it's still, when you try and wrap your head around it, it's mind-blowing. It is the most abstract, counterintuitive thing to try and understand. So, so I'll, I'll try and help you understand it. Um, so Newton thought of gravity as a force between two things. Einstein said, 
gravity is not a force between any two things. It's what happens whenever you have mass or energy or both. Because everywhere in the universe is space and where there's space, there's time. So there's this thing called space-time. Space isn't empty, it's full of space-time. Okay, so space-time is kind of like this medium that's not really anything, but it is a medium and it can be distorted by the presence of mass or energy, because we know they're the same thing, or things that affect mass and energy, so things that add energy, like momentum, like giving speed to something. Those things can all mess with this fabric that makes up space called space-time. A really common way of thinking about it that people give is if you imagine a mattress or a stretched out rubber sheet and you plonk a bowling ball in the middle of it, the rubber sheet gets bent down, it gets distorted, it gets curved around the bowling ball. And if you can imagine that space is something like a rubber sheet and that um, anything that has mass or energy, whether it's a planet or a sun, is something like a bowling ball or a tennis ball depending on its size, and it distorts the space-time around it, that's what you're getting to with Einstein's, um, with Einstein's theory of general relativity. So gravity isn't a force between things. It's what happens when you mess with space-time. When you distort it, when you drop a bowling ball in it, space-time isn't straight anymore. It's bendy. It gets distorted. Space and time get stretched. Time can get stretched. Space gets stretched. Time can get stretched. It's crazy. It's so counterintuitive, but it's true. And light can be bent because of the roundness, because of the, um, the, the bowling ball and the rubber mat effect. And this is where we know that um, Einstein, not just having great ideas, but having ideas that can be tested and proven a few years after it was published. So it was published in 1917 at the end of Paths to Abstraction. And uh, a, a few, two years later, a, um, uh, an eclipse, a voyage, uh, you know, expedition to an eclipse was actually able to measure so the sun is pretty big, a lot of mass, a lot of energy, warps space-time around it. Stars behind the sun send their light to us. That light, if it was really going to be bent by the sun, should bend around the sun and come back towards us and we should be able to see it. Now, the problem with that is the sun's a fairly bright thing and if you look at it, you're not going to see the light from stars behind it, you're going to burn a hole in your retina. So by using an eclipse... It darkened the sun that was there and they were able to see the stars behind it appearing in front of the sun, in front of the, where, where they would have been if the light had been bent around it. So Einstein, not just a crazy idea, not just linking space and time in this ridiculous counterintuitive way, but in a way that can be shown to be true and it's become a, a, the basis of, um, of cosmology and, and studies of planets and space travel ever since. So just to give a, a little practical example of what it means, it doesn't mean anything for us, you know that, it doesn't mean, because we're not travelling at fast speeds and we're not huge massive bodies, you have to be the size of the sun, you're not, okay, you might have gained a couple, but you're not. Um, it's, if you're the size of a sun or something, yes, if you're, um, if you're travelling at near light speed, yes, these things are incredibly important. For us in our everyday lives, they're just things to every once in a while go, wow, what, you know, what was he thinking? That's so, where did that come from? Is he like some antenna that just grabs ideas out of the sky? So if we were to be living in a relativistic world, so if we were actually living at anywhere near the speed of light, our world would look very different. Um, if I were to, um, if I were to, well, you know that if I walk across the room, I'm going to gain some weight. I'm also going to have a slightly different experience of time uh, by doing that because movement through space-time distorts time as well. Uh, the faster I move, the more time slows down. If we were living in a near relativistic light sp uh, speed, so we were moving at near light speed, things would look very different for us. It, they would feel very different. So if there was me, and then say if you got on a, um, on a bicycle or something and rode across the front here, to me, while you were sitting there on your bicycle, you'd just look normal. But as soon as you started riding your bike anywhere near the speed of light, which would be entirely possible in this universe, you would suddenly look like this enormous mass-laden glump of a thing and all of your movements would be slowed down and if you called out hooray to a friend, it would be so distorted and so slow because as you're moving, you're distorting space-time 
and the, the way I'm seeing you is completely different. You, however, would feel just like you on a bicycle and you would see me and I would be standing on the, on the footpath looking like this massive thing because you're moving relative to me. So I'm not doing anything, but because there's movement relative to us, it goes a little crazy. So lucky for us, we don't live at that relativistic speed. It would be very damaging for self-image um, and, uh, and not to mention breaking a few laws of physics along the way. Um, there's more to say, but I would just like to... Obviously, that's just one person in it, but he was the guy who made the big difference in terms of abstract thinking, and he was the one who took science on its path to abstraction during um, this period we're talking about. But let's... I don't want to give the, uh, you the idea that um, Einstein was flawless. He was, like all of us, uh, flawed, and um, he did make a couple of classic stuff-ups. One was uh, when he was doing his calculations for the theory of general relativity, it did look like the universe either had to be expanding or contracting. That's what his rules were telling him. But rather than go with it, which he did in so many other cases, for some reason he drew the line there and went, oh, no, everyone else reckons it's a steady state. So he made up a constant and whacked it in there to counteract the effect of gravity. And it was his biggest regret that he had done that. Well, that's one of his regrets. The other thing was he was one of the um, founders, I guess, or the people who made quantum theory possible. So we've been talking about the very fast, the very big. The other thing that was going on is quantum theory, the study of the very, very small subatomic world. Um, to his dying day, he thought it was a load of tosh and uh, that it would one day be explained by something better. So he was, um, he was a great man, but we shouldn't ever be mistaken just because someone has done incredible work into thinking that they are always going to be right or that we should ever stop questioning them because, um, as Peter Doherty, the Australian Nobel laureate, says there is a great potential for old white men to cause a lot of trouble. So, um, so don't stop questioning them. Don't stop questioning any of us. I just call myself a great man. Uh, don't, don't stop questioning anyone because uh, that's also part of the foundation of science, not the abstract bit, but the bit that makes it great and helps us to get where we are. Thanks very much for um, coming along tonight and uh, it's been lovely to have your company. Cheers, thank you.